for Michelle, and then I'll kick it off to Michelle to start her presentation. So Michelle uh, Werbeck is the founder and CEO of Silta Strategy LLC, where she focuses on policy uh, and legislation for clients that transform communities through justice, treatment, and re uh, recovery collaborations. She's also the global lead for, the, for the internal co consortium for inter alternatives to incarceration. So Michelle is also a former magistrate, acting judge, and policy. Supreme Court of Ohio. So overall, this virtual pr presentation will be focusing on the critical aspects of privacy and compliance when sharing data amongst different entities, where Michelle will be covering our the best the best practices, legal requirements, and practical point pointers needed to support effective operations. And with that, I will turn this over to Michelle. Erickson and Deidre and Friends and colleagues on the call, thanks so much for having me here. I, I do get really geeked out about these privacy presentations, um, not necessarily because I was drawn deeply into the area right away, but because I just believe that um, unlike a lot of lawyers who are going to say, no, don't do it, don't talk, don't do it, don't share, um, we're nervous, oh my gosh, a collaborative environment, no, we can't do it, I'm the person who says yes. Um, so as a practical introduction to me, and so you get to know a little bit about my philosophy and where I come from in being compliant, um, I'm really very person-centered. My bachelor's degree is in psychology. I've spent a whole career trying to reconcile that with my law degree and training <laughs> that when you punish people, they quit doing the things you don't want them to do. Um, if you have treatment needs, and I know I'm kind of speaking to the choir on this one, or if you have instabilities in your day-to-day -day life, it is just not that simple. And so I have spent a whole career living at the intersections of systems, at the intersections of programs and needs. And, and I'm telling you, that's a rough place to be because things fall through the cracks. They don't transition well. And so if my philosophy is, let's look at the person, what do they need? Right. And this, I think, is probably speaking to a truth that the health collaborative has. Um, it's not one program. It's not one input. It's very person centered. What are their strengths? What are their needs? How do we work with them and get them to where they need to be? Um, to do that, you have to have collaboration and teamwork. I've just never seen one program or one system that has all the answers. And so we need to reach out and work together. And we're dealing with some of the most sensitive, private, protected information that someone can even have. And, and so we have all these laws that can be intimidating. And I see groups that just ignore the laws and they say, well, we know better than that person who should have their information. We're going to conveniently ignore the law because we have this very um, you know, parental uh, philosophy about that. Or you have people say, we're just not going to do the work together. Sorry, I'm not going to join your collaboration because my lawyer told me no, right? Or there's a lot of paperwork or I'm confused and I don't want to get in trouble. So I have been in this space to number one, support your mission, to support what you need to do, to support the partnerships, to really respect the privacy of people and some of their most sensitive information and some of the struggles you're going through. And also at the same time, make sure you stay out of trouble with these federal laws. So that's kind of my introduction and kind of context for the presentation. It is not legal advice. So we're recorded. I'll say that again. This is not legal advice, but I will share with you. Let me pull up my PowerPoint um, so we can start going through the material. I'll talk for a while. Um, and then let me see. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, so you'll also kind of see. Here we go. And get it into slideshow mode. If my computer is going to let me do that. Okay, great. Um, can everyone see the screen? Erickson, yep. I see you. Okay, yep. good. Thumbs up from Erickson. So here I go. Um, no more on intros. Let me um, share with you then what is a doable chunk that we can have for today. Um, one thing mm -hmm. I'm going to do is explore information sharing in dynamic collaborative environments. I think if that wasn't the case that we were in, you could listen to all kinds of privacy presentations and be just fine. But this is our space and it looks a little different. Um, I want you to gain a basic understanding of HIPAA in part two, and I'll tell you what part two is in a minute. 
including the fact that there are some legal updates. We'll cover the legal updates very briefly, but the slides that you'll receive a copy of have more details if you need it, and then obviously you can drill down to the laws themselves. There's a framework that is going to help you understand when these requirements even kick in when you have a collaboration, and so I want to make sure we go through that. And then also at the end of the day, give you the cheat sheet of here's how you comply. So now that we're understanding that we need to comply and when we need to comply, here are some best practices. And then here's me, CELTA strategy. So I do all kinds of things. Privacy is at the bottom, not because it's the least important thing, um, but you can see I, I work a lot in multi-system environments. Um, and so again, they're all looking a little different and a little unique, which is why the Q&A will be really helpful today. But I'm gonna give you an appreciation of what privacy looks like in that kind of an environment. And um, just a, a note on collaborations, whether you're doing continuity of care, care coordination, um, if you're in this alternative to incarceration space, I just want to um, acknowledge that collaborations are here because we're trying to find solutions. And we understand that our individual part is a part of the solution, but when we come together as a whole collaboration, then we can agree on, we can agree on our shared outcomes, we can value the individual roles we have, but again, mind those intersections and just realizing that in this day and age, information sharing is often part of the solution. And that's really what drove me uh, to become kind of a privacy geek. Um, I love the law and in exploring legal information. I also like making it very practical. And to be honest, what I found was there weren't a lot of people that got the collaborative space. And so I had all kinds of organizations coming up to me, sharing what they thought the law said, but it wasn't applied well to the collaborative space. So that's kind of what drove me to develop this. And, and I, I really have a heart for the work you do. And so I want to make sure that you're well equipped with what you need. Also, let's talk about this collaborative space. We are in an age where information is flying all over the place. And so if you look at the individual we're serving, which would be that orange kind of rectangle, um, here there's assuming that there's a centralized individual record. That's certainly helpful when we have a lot of partners working together. But even if not, when you look at that individual information, we have some people that are interacting directly with individual records or a shared record. They're putting information in. They may be pulling information out. Sometimes they use it in isolation, but sometimes they then talk to their partners who don't have access to the direct record, but they're getting that information indirectly from your work. And then you may have stakeholders like researchers or funders, and they want to evaluate your effectiveness or look at what's being done with their funding. They're not getting all the information, but they are all part of this web of information sharing that we are now trying to grapple with. So I want to kind of in general, acknowledge that this dynamic environment really is dynamic. See, just clients. And I think I kind of alluded to the fact that we have people that may be having some pretty big life struggles. They may not feel comfortable sharing this. If they're working with your collaborative, they're trusting you to help them through that. And so I think when we honor privacy in a way that honors the individual, and makes great use of the information, and is also technically legally compliant, that that's an important part of the relationship. So when I talk about what the A answer is, you're going to hear this compassion come up again. Um, but just want to reiterate, we're person focused, we're going to take care of their needs, we're really going to honor the um, sensitivity of the situations that we're working through. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some legal stuff <laughs> and I'll keep it fairly higher level. Here's a framework that I devise that is particularly helpful for collaborations. Um, we do not start talking about what is protected health information and here's why. That can be distracting. Um, if I am talking to my neighbor at the bus stop in the morning and they start telling me health information or struggles with substance use, and I'm there as a consultant and their neighbor, probably not even a consultant. I'm wearing my I'm your neighbor hat. 
HIPAA does not apply to that conversation. Part two does not apply to that conversation. I should be sensitive and not spread that information all over the neighborhood, but there's no obligation for me to keep that protected. So when we start with a collaboration, we look at who has the legal obligation initially to protect information. We then explore, did I inherit that legal obligation because of the information I'm receiving? And then we look at if I'm sharing information, what are the legal obligations that go along with that sharing? So that is a simplified version of this framework. And what I'll do is just kind of take you step by step through um, this, as well as the laws that we need to comply with. Um, HIPAA. I hear all the time, HIPAA applies, HIPAA this, HIPAA that. And knowing what HIPAA means, I think about maybe half the time people are getting that right. So HIPAA is used as a shield for I don't want to talk to you or I can't talk to you. Um, and, and we're going to understand a little bit about how that unfolds. Because HIPAA and Part 2 are so different, I really want to give you a little bit of an appreciation for where HIPAA came from. Um, it was back in the 90s. And in the 90s, we were as a society getting away from sending things in the mail, sending a paper invoice, sending a paper check to pay it. Um, and we really need to think about what that looked like. People felt very comfortable when their health information was on a sheet of paper in a manila file in the doctor's office. It would get walked over to the photocopy machine. Copies were put in an envelope. You might have it go over a fax machine, but it was physical and tangible. And even though that has all kinds of opportunities to have, um, you know, disclosures, it would not be um, appropriate. There was a comfort with that physical environment. When society started switching over to an electronic environment, it was really created to provide a standard format for electronic billing. So that's really what HIPAA was about. But what the ongoing conversation with HIPAA is, if you're not in that space, is, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen to my information when it's no longer physical? Will it be protected? So you see lots of detail in HIPAA, lots of protections, electronic information protection and the like, because that's the space that we were in. And there was a lot of nervousness and discomfort about that. And so HIPAA is very helpful and very directive. HIPAA also at that point did not want to put barriers into sharing information for some common uses. And so you have some blanket uses that you're allowed to do under HIPAA. Okay, so that's HIPAA. Switching over to part two. So part two is actually the cool abbreviation for 42 CFR part two. So thankfully, we have a nickname. If you call it 42 CFR, though, people know that you don't know what you're talking about. That's actually a whole big part of our legal regulations. And so if you want to be cool, just call it part two. Trust me on that one um, and you'll be good. So what is part two? When you look back, the earliest tracings would be the 1940s when we started looking at confidentiality and substance use disorder protections were added in the 70s. So now we're going even further back in time. We, um, you know, there, there is some drug use happening. If someone reaches out for treatment, so think about the generation that was active in the 70s, a lot more private, right? Not putting things on Facebook, not talking to the neighbor about it at the bus stop, right? A much more private society. Um, stigma, uh, what was, you know, around substance use still is. Um, so a lot of stigma and also not as much structure on substance use disorder treatment programs. So in that space, the theme there is light on details of how to comply because we would have not anticipated the environment that we operate in now back in the 70s. Sensitivity to the stigma and the personal nature of the information and basically, you cannot share anything without permission. So if I would want to say, here is the general thing you think of with part two, it is extremely protective and you almost always need patient permission to share. OK, so with that background, we're going to go through the framework. And first of all, we want to learn, well, who's covered initially under these laws? OK, we're definitely not neighbors at the bus stop chit chatting. HIPAA, I'm not going to spend a lot of time covering. You have the details here. I think a lot of people have a pretty good sense, but I'm going to give you a reminder that initial compliance with HIPAA is health plans, clearing houses, and healthcare providers. Again, not neighbors, 
not some of the people that will say, I can't talk to you because of HIPAA. This is where HIPAA compliance starts. And if you're in this category from the get go, everything you do has to comply with HIPAA. Part two program is going to be um, tied to definitions. And I'm going to talk to them a little bit, um, talk to you about them a little bit because they're fairly expansive. And again, that goes with the very protective nature of part two. So you need to have federal assistance and be a program. For a program, that seems like it's more than one person, but it's actually an individual or an entity who holds themselves out. And I don't need read many slides, but this is one I'm really going to hone in on. You hold yourself out and you actually provide SUD diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment. You may say, Michelle, I'm not a treatment provider. I am not a Part 2 program. I'm an individual. I don't provide treatment. It doesn't apply to me. Well, do you do a diagnosis? Even if it's a diagnosis, it is just an initial um, diagnosis to help decide whether someone could be part of a program or even participate in your collaborative. Diagnostic services alone, even by an individual, is enough to um, check the program box. The other thing when we're in collaborations, what do we do? We refer people to each other. We work together. So referral for treatment is a real thing that we need to think about in collaborations. If that is your only role is to refer people for SUD treatment, that actually could be enough to qualify you as a program. Now, a little caveat, I saw some medical people here. If you are uh, offering general medical services and so people come to you and they happen to have a substance use disorder, they arrive at your emergency department, that does not mean your ED is a part two program. Um, because we know that that um, just like EMS providers, you know, you're taking care of everyone walking in the door. But if you have a special unit that has medical management of withdrawal, that unit probably is a part two program. And then you can drill down if you have specialty programs that um, work with substance use disorder, that also is likely to be a part two program. Um, federal assistance, we're not going to go through all these examples. Needless to say, when you get these slides and read through, Almost everyone has federal assistance these days. Even if you don't get money from the federal government, if you're nonprofit, your donors get um, a tax break. And so that is enough to qualify. And you may get state funding. And even if the state funding is not um, allocated um, by the federal government for the state to spend on SUD, that could also trigger federal assistance. So again, these definitions with part two are very expansive tending toward the very protective nature of the law. So are you a covered entity under HIPAA or a part two program under part two? If the answer is no, um, and so I give some examples, probably a lot of these slides are prepared a little bit more for the legal um, community. But if you're a community service provider and all you do is provide rides for people, then you're not a part two program. If you're a police officer, probably not a part two program, data analyst. OK, easy yeses, treatment provider, um, I am part of an EMS team. Those are easy yeses. Lots of people in the extra thinking, and I welcome this as part of the Q&A. Social workers, well, what do you do? Who do you work for? All kinds of details we need to know before we can really say yes or no on initial compliance. Same with case managers, volunteers, peers. Um, those are areas, again, and, and this is probably one of the biggest areas that we have in Q&A, is just understanding some of these gray spaces where it's not a clear yes or no. Once we know, if, so if you are, and I'm going to go back here, if you are a covered entity or a Part 2 program, then right off the bat, you need to comply with the applicable law, one or both of them. Now we're going to look at the information that's protected. So HIPAA, we hear a lot about PHI, protected health information. If I go into my physician's office and they are very detailed in their note taking and they say that I've got a white shirt on today and, and I'm wearing my glasses and whatever else they're doing, now that's probably not protected health information, but it may be part of the record. So when we look at HIPAA, we are only looking at that information that drills down to physical and mental health um, and, and conditions, um, the provision of health care, and also it, it uh, relates to the payment of the provision of health care. OK, so not the whole record, the details that really relate to the need for protection. Here comes part two, very protective. 
they're covering the whole record. So technically, if someone wrote down, I had a white shirt today when I came in and I was wearing my glasses, you're not allowed to tell anybody that. Do I care if people know that I had a white shirt? Not really, but this law has blanket protection and it is the whole record, okay? Um, and that is a really big distinction. Looking at patient, um, one of the nuances I wanna point out here is that if you have applied for diagnosis, treatment, or referral, but you haven't gotten it yet, the mere fact that you applied for it or you were referred to an organization to get that already makes you a patient. And in a part two, you cannot even say whether or not someone is a patient. So I have had to coach organizations that I've been in. You cannot confirm or deny whether or not someone is a patient. Um, if they are a patient and if there is permission to talk to someone, then information could be disclosed. Otherwise, there's nothing that can be provided either way. Diagnosis is also written very broadly. It's not just a diagnosis of a substance use disorder, but it also is a condition that is identified as having been caused by that substance use disorder. So again, be very careful on part two. It is very expansively written. So there was the... Oh. Keep going. Okay. Did, all you. right, yep. thanks. I was trying to see if there's a question coming up. Um, I'll definitely leave time for Q&A at the end, but don't want to um, override someone's question here. Um, so here, going back to the framework, if I am not initially a covered entity or a part two program, so we got through the first level, you're like, whew, I don't have to pay attention to this. Now we're going to ask you, do you receive PHI? If you don't, fine, you're still off the hook. But if you do, now you are stepping into a space where that information that you receive has to be protected, just like the covered entity has to protect it. And usually we're going to give you the name business associate. Again, lots of generalities here. Um, and so you are now stepping into compliance space. So congratulations, um, you two need to comply with HIPAA. Same with part two programs. So you're not a part two program, but do you receive patient records? If so, then you need to give it the same protection that the Part 2 program did. The special title that you'll usually have is a Qualified Service Organization, or QSO. Uh, I'm not going to use those terms a lot, but just so you understand the vocabulary, that's where um, it would apply. Um, and then if you're a covered entity or a Part 2 program, I certainly hope that you are collecting protected health information and that you do have patient records. So um, these are probably some easy questions to answer. Of course, you have the information that's protected and you need to keep it protected. Then moving on. So we know who's initially covered under the laws, who is stepping into obligations to protect information. Now let's look at the sharing environment. So if you have information that has some protections, what does sharing that further look like? First of all, if information is de-identified, it cannot possibly be linked to the individual, either because it's aggregated, it's general data points combined with lots of other general data points, or you have stripped the record down so much that it's impossible to link it to someone, then that would not be covered under these protections, under HIPAA or part two. My caution here is this. If you are in a small community, if you are drilling down so much that you have very small numbers in your organization, last one referral to your program, the person had schizophrenia. Let's say that that referral was part of an EMS call to someone's home. And if you get on your police app, you're going to see enough information that you can put two and two together and figure out that that one referral was your neighbor. And now you're going to get a little bit more information about that person. That number size is so small that even though no one gave out the person's name or address or anything that alone would individually identify the neighbor, or you've aggregated the data, if you don't have enough, a big enough pool, then it makes it hard to track it down, then you may not truly be de-identified. So that's my caution there. Um, we have categories of disclosures. Just, um, you don't need to know the details of this, but HIPAA and part two are structured very differently. And so the categories don't even match up. So when I talk about HIPAA, it's really hard to do kind of a side-by-side -side comparison because they're just structured fundamentally differently. 
but I'm going to get you to the key information that you need to know. So under HIPAA, I kind of alluded before, we are acknowledging that in this environment, some sharing is necessary. If we don't share your health information to the person paying the bill, then your healthcare provider is not going to get paid, right? So we need to share that. We need to talk to other people on the team so that we can provide you with good treatment. And the reality is healthcare organizations have licensure um, audits and all kinds of things where people may come across your protected health information. All of those are okay. It's also okay to give individual a copy of their own record. Individuals have some power to agree or object to sharing and they can put some limitations on it, but overall there are opportunities to share this information within the structure of HIPAA. It's not a free for all, still need to comply, but you're not going to need a written individual authorization. Okay, so HIPAA again is trying to be very practical, but put guardrails so that we don't have unintended sharing. You're going to know the theme under part two. <laughs> um, first of all, part two has expansive definitions. And when we talk about disclosure, um, it includes a reference to publicly available information. I have seen collaboration say, oh, this is so much work. What are we going to do? And so then you start doing the hint, hint. If you happen to, to look at this website, you might notice something about this person. Well, if you are, um, if that is your patient, right? Even if you don't say it's my patient, you are just making some general reference to publicly available information because you are the one doing it and you had obligations under part two that turned into a disclosure without you sharing that they were your patient, without you directly sharing the information, pointing someone in the right direction to find it is actually a disclosure. So again, very protective. Part two is not feel free to share where it's helpful and it makes sense. Part two is you can pretty much never share unless you have very specific written patient consent for all of the disclosures and redisclosures of the information. Okay, complete opposite starting point. Exceptions to this. Some people like to say it's an emergency. Think about substance use. I had a friend of mine, very dear friend, psychologist, basically said if someone uses drugs, it is always an emergency because you never know when you're going to have that tainted supply and they could die. So that is an expansive definition of an emergency. I was like, nope, emergency is actually pretty narrowly construed under part two. So we're not going to give lots of leeway under emergency. And the other piece of it is, even if you rely on a medical emergency, you have to do paperwork afterwards that's even more cumbersome to tell people that you made an emergency disclosure. So you're kind of not off the hook for the paperwork under part two. And you can also see a couple of other very um, limited opportunities to use this without patient consent. But you can see here part of the A plus compliance answer is you're going to have to have an appropriately written document that the patient signs that allows all the conversations that are going to be taking place with their information. That's your A plus answer. Um, disclosure. Um, I'm not going to dive too deeply in here. If you were in this space, I would say when you get the slide deck, take a look at this. Um, the, the space is changing and this really is kind of in the weeds um, applicable to people that are part two programs. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to you know, allow you to take a quick look at this, um, but we can talk about that later in the Q&A if you want to, and then you can also have it later for your um, further kind of edification and, and education. Under both laws, when you share information, minimum necessary, please don't share more than what someone absolutely needs to know to get the job done that they're doing, okay? Um, and then under part two, traditionally, there has always been a strict prohibition on any redisclosures. So if I get part two information, now I, again, as we learned, need to protect it, just like I was a part two program to begin with. And if I want to do a redisclosure, I need to have that very um, clear written permission by the patient allowing redisclosure. This is shifting some, okay, some, but not entirely. And we'll talk about that briefly at the end. So if you share PHI 
or patient records, then you are going to need to comply with these laws. And again, PHI, probably a uh, relationship to the covered entity would be a business associate. Patient records, your relationship to a Part 2 program is often going to be a qualified service organization. All right, so going back to the framework, when we look at the upper left-hand corner, am I originally covered under the law? If you are, you are. <laughs> um, if you're not, you're not entirely off the hook. You can collect information initially with your patients and that's not going to be protected, but be careful because if you start receiving information from other parts of the collaborative and it is PHI or a patient record from a part two program, now you are stepping into the compliance space. And if you're hanging on to it, you need to keep it protected. If you're sharing it, then you have even more protections that you need to offer to the disclosures. And again, if you're covered initially, I would certainly hope that you have PHI and patient records. And then so always carefully protecting what you have in-house. And again, being aware that there's another level of protections that cloak your disclosures. So what are the best practices that we have? There are three kinds of relationships or three areas where we need to be compliant. One is our relationship with the patient or the person that we're serving. So there are notices that they need to have so they understand legally what their rights are. I think you've learned by now that when you were looking at part two programs and part two um, patient records, you need written permission to share the information. And we need to carefully craft it. So I would highly recommend that you map out your information sharing. Sometimes someone will give you an individual um, permission. This is my emergency contact person. I don't want you to tell them anything. Um, or you can say that I'm a patient, but that's it. Then you may have a group authorization that allows for the ongoing dynamic discussions within and between group members, including the disclosure and redisclosure of information that's protected. And that is a space that these typical forms and typical trainings don't tend to cover, but that really covers the dynamic work that you do as a collaboration. So again, do the work, share the information, understand how to be compliant, um, and make sure that you have the written permission to do what you're doing. That is the A plus answer. Um, who signs, be careful if you have minors, foster care applications, things like that, and understand that these written permissions are only as good as a person wants you to have it. They can change their mind. And if they change their mind, then we make sure we document that and we respect the change of mind. Here's the personal part of it. Um, it's not just a bunch of paperwork. So number one, I think people are less sensitive about signing these forms. We all sign lots of forms. And so it becomes a little bit less intrusive into the relationship because everyone just blames the lawyers and people don't like lawyers and they get it. We make you do paperwork and they sign. But the other thing I would say is this, think about that trusting, caring relationship. I think it is a boost to the relationship for you to say, this is how our team works. We're a collaboration. Here are the members of the collaboration. Here's what we have to offer you. You're not forced to work with us, um, but if you work with us, here's what we do, and here's how we do it, and here's how we work together. And here's the kind of information that we all share so that we can wrap around and provide the best care for you. And you find out if they're interested. You find out if that's something that they're wanting to do. And then once you've really fully explained what you're doing and how you take very careful care of their information and its sensitivity, then when they sign the form, it's part of building that trusting relationship. It's not an annoying legal document. And when you've done a great job of mapping everywhere the information goes, you capture that in the initial form. And so it's available and it's not lots and lots and lots of forms and you're trying to track them down and find them to sign more forms. So I just want to humanize this piece of compliance and allow that to be a relationship builder, not a detractor. All right, between organizations. So you've heard about business associates and qualified service organizations and all the interactions between organizations. There is documentation that will help you with that too. So definitely mapping this, looking at the framework to see where compliance obligations start making sure that you have your BA or QSO agreements or contracts in place. And then if you have any other data sharing agreements or MOUs that are helpful, tidy all that up so that everyone understands their mutual obligations. 
And then finally, internally, um, once you do have to um, honor HIPAA or Part 2 or both, there are statutory and regulatory requirements for internal policies, procedures, trainings, things like that, and also making sure that you're prepared to make an accounting of all the disclosures that you make. Um, and Deidre talked about there are technology enhancements. So some of this really is still going to fall on you as a member of a collaboration and your collaboration as a whole so that you know when privacy requirements start and who's allowed to receive information. Um, so there are ways to assist you with it, but you're still going to have to participate. Um, technology companies are not in the best position to know when compliance obligations begin and end. All right, now um, very briefly, um, I will share that in 2020, as part of the CARES Act, back when we were in the pandemic, um, there was a partial reconciliation between HIPAA and Part 2. It was really cumbersome, and people started saying, this is just hard. Can we make this a little easier? And so they considered um, that. They made it a little easier, and I'm going to give some caveats to it. Um, a final rule then, so the rule tells us how to comply with the law. And so the rule was published early this year. You can start doing things under the rule. You would be allowed to have some of the easier things under the rule beginning in April of 2024. I don't know that a whole lot of people have really started switching their systems and their um, workflow over to this yet. But if there's something here that you're like, wow, that would make life easy, go for it. You can do it now. On the other hand, you're not going to get in trouble for not complying until February of 2026. So there is a window of transition, which is why I still need to tell you the old stuff and I need to share with you some of the new things. And I'm gonna cover the new things really quickly. Um, Health and Human Services, that's our federal department. They, this is um, in their wheelhouse. And they said, the reason why we did it, we wanna increase coordination so that is great because that's what our collaborations are about. We want to strengthen our patient confidentiality protections, and we want to enhance integration of behavioral health information into our medical records. So that all makes sense. Um, how are we doing this? They are making the consents, so those written permission documents, um, be able to cloak more interactions. I think we're still going to need to do our homework and have it specifically applied to the situation we're in, but they are starting to um, try to rely on one single patient consent for some ongoing redisclosures. Um, they are looking at redisclosures of Part 2 records. If you are a HIPAA-covered entity or BA, they're making it easier for you, not for everybody. But if you are only compliant with HIPAA, so you're a healthcare organization, you receive Part 2 records, once you receive it, now you can kind of basically put it into your HIPAA workflow. You don't have a lot of those extra um, burdens that Part 2 provided. There are new patient rights, and so that's good as we are loosening up some of our restrictions. And the flip side is that the patients are having some more rights. Um, HHS now has enforcement authority, including not only the imposition of criminal penalties, but civil monetary penalties for Part 2 violations. What does that mean? It means that before you probably didn't hear a whole lot about people getting in trouble for Part 2 violations, there's going to be a lot more attention. So just like we have for HIPAA, there's a, an arm that really looks out for those violations and takes care of them with civil or criminal monetary or criminal or civil monetary penalties, part two is going to be more visible in that space. So if you feel like you weren't totally compliant, but no one seemed to care, well, people might start caring more and enforcing more. Uh, there's some information here about consents. Just be aware that the consent space, if you're a part two program or a QSO, that is shifting. All right, and I'm just going to click through this quickly. If you really want to dive into those details, I think that's probably a whole nother conversation, but I'm going to give you this so if it applies to you, you can start going through and having a heads up. Um, one thing, though, is, uh, let me see. Yep, this is more um, information that's kind of for the good of the cause. In terms of enhanced protections, um, a couple other things I want to point out. If something is ever going to go into court, you, that needs a separate permission to share in a court setting. So if there's, for instance, custody um, disputes, 
that you cannot kind of link that into your general permissions. That needs to be a standalone permission or it can only be shared by court order. Counseling notes. So if you're an STD treatment provider, your counseling notes now have that extra special protection that we have with mental health and psychology psychotherapy notes. And there is a separate non-discrimination rule. It's not part of this, but they are basically saying, if you receive this now super sensitive information, we don't want you to punish the person that you were learning about. So if you're a health insurance company, if you're a life insurance company, if you are a medical provider and we think that you are discriminating against that person because now you know they have a substance use disorder, that's going to be newly problematic for you. Okay. That's the end. Your brains are probably on overload. That was a lot to cover. Um, I have some government resources. I tend to find that these are most helpful when you're in a simple transactional, like one directional transaction, kind of simple information. But this will also give you some good information in general um, about the changes to part two. Um, there is an article that walks through that framework that I shared, and so here's a link to that. It's applied to the pre-arrest deflection space, um, but you'll clearly see kind of how we walk through this if you want a little bit of a refresher. Oh, I pulled the old slide. Um, there is more of a policy article that I've published internationally balancing this privacy with access to service and research. So if you need the, you can Google this, but if you need the site, let me know. It has been published, and sorry about that. Um, and otherwise, I'm here to help out and really glad to have started the conversation with you today. So I will stop sharing. Hopefully, everyone's still in the meeting. And um, I'm glad to answer whatever questions um, you have. And if we need to schedule more time to talk, glad to do that too. Michelle, I just want to say thank you <clears throat> so much. I have lots of questions, but I want to <laughs> pause and, and let the um, community um, ask anything, but we just wanted to say thank you. And somebody asked in the chat, will the slides be made available? We recorded the session and the slides will be available. So we want this broad education to go across the community. We invited lots of friends who are not necessarily always in the behavioral health space too. So um, this is a critical topic for care coordination. So spread it, share it, um, and yeah. we will send it out. So questions from the group? So, hi, I'm Pam Jensen from the Hospital Council in um, Northwest Ohio, and I think we're all facing similar issues um, in our region. So we have these collaboratives that want to try to help, um, particularly when, um, when, when people with um, mental health or substance abuse disorders move between hospitals, jails, courts, and, and move them in the right place. And we want to try to share information, but you know, the hospitals, so I represent the hospitals and the hospitals are like, no, nope, HIPAA, not going to do that. Yeah. And, and so th that is the issue that we're all faced with. And I'm not sure what the, what the answer is to that. I think maybe what I heard in the presentation was if I, as a collaborative who was doing this, we could get those people who move within that system to sign a release, we could potentially do that. We could share information. Absolutely. And hospitals could do it too. I think what, what I see, and I really respect the hospital space, um, strict compliance teams, there's a lot at stake. There is a lot of people and everyone has the information. Um, and so the compliance tends to be locked down really tightly as it should be. And the research is done to protect the hospital in fairly simple transactions. So I see a lot of hospitals that really haven't contemplated a collaborative approach and the resharing and kind of this dynamic environment. So what I would say that the benefit of a group like this or the collaborations that you're in is have some group discussions. Um, you know, the research shows that health outcomes improve when you have those community, the social determinants of health or in the SUD world, more kindly maybe referred to as protective factors. But nonetheless, we know that when we take care of all of the issues that a person is struggling with, all of their outcomes improve. So there's good motivation. It makes financial sense. It makes sense with outcomes. I think having a multi, you know, looking at the group that is interested in sharing the information and really is a strong stakeholder and working together to come to an understanding. And then again, it kind of goes back to a lawyer that understands collaborations, which is not part of lawyer training, 
and can really drill through and understand how do we simplify this? I gave you the complexity so that you would recognize that it actually applies. And, and Pam, I appreciate it. You picked up on the A answer. Map your information flow. Make sure we're all clear where it's going. Get permission up front to have the information go where it needs to go, and then you're covered. What I'll also share is hospitals will probably have additional forms to be signed that have been vetted by the hospital. Once hospitals develop forms, they're really not going to renegotiate it for you. That's okay. You can have extra forms, but what's most helpful is you have that form that's created by the stakeholders together. Mm -hmm. And again, is legally compliant, but I think that's kind of your two-part thing. How the stakeholders agree where information is flowing and have paperwork that covers it. And then in addition, still allow the hospital to have its own compliance workflow. That has been the, the path I have seen work best. Other questions? So anything at me? Hopefully you're not overwhelmed with the information and it's just too much. Hi, Michelle, it's Lauren. <clears throat> and I um, don't know if anyone on the call would be willing to speak up on this. I'm gonna speak in generalities, but over the last few years, something we've heard is the struggle to share between three particular entities, a hospital or health system, a community mental health provider, and our for-profit freestanding inpatient psychiatric units. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience or feedback on that relationship? I think we all, um, many, all three of those entities are here today. They all are really collaborative, but I, we still continue to hear those challenges. And I think it is an interpretation challenge, but I'm curious if you've heard feedback on particularly that kind of uh, try out of a relationship? Absolutely, all the time. And so here's kind of the progression that helps. First of all, a presentation like this, where people have a little bit better understanding. Again, I think you have experts that have drilled down on what they do in-house. And so you were a really deep expert on your in-house stuff, but you're not an expert on what your collaborators are doing. And that's where the nervousness arises, okay? So when you can kind of see the picture from different angles and have an appreciation of where things are coming from, that can help. Um, then just really understanding that when you have well-crafted written documentation allowing the sharing, that eases things. And, and the good thing about both part two and HIPAA is they're pretty clear on the exact words you need to have in these forms. So there's some things that are different that will describe the dynamic relationship. But then the rest of it is pretty clear. So I think you're working with people that have a good expertise, but it's focused on, again, non-dynamic conversations. When they understand the dynamic environment and the interplay between the two, they have confidence that there are is documentation that can cover. Then I think the lawyers continuing to talk together can be very helpful. And a little bit of a disclaimer, I do some of the legal contracting work for these data solutions. And I'll share with you, the hospital lawyers are the most hesitant because they not only are you a hospital lawyer, but you also are a compliance team member and you're very comfortable in the lane that you've crafted for those typical interactions. This is a new space. So I think providing the layers of education and discussion and support is really what's most helpful. In the end, once you cross that, um, people are really glad. And I would lean heavily into the data showing, look, this collaborative space is where we need to be. It saves our hospital money. We're not going to have as many readmissions. When people get care, they're more likely to comply with their care, which is going to help them make better, you know, become better. There are all kinds of good reasons to do it. And you can reassure your um, compliance people that you get it. And so sometimes the really smart compliance people are relieved that someone's talking about part two. That is actually even part two programs don't always talk about part two. So I think um, having a robust presentation that shows that we get it right. We're not just giving you a general heads up, but like we deeply get this space and can answer those questions. Um, again, I think general familiarity and then that deep support can help people get on board to have those common forms and the protocols. And again, the hospitals will want to also have their own protocols and that's fine. So you're not trying to replace 
compliance protocols for any organization you're trying to enhance by allowing this dynamic collaboration. It's not easy, it will take some time. Other questions? Michelle, I have a question um, related to uh, the entity that if there's a uh, ability to map, as you say, the exchange of data, which is critical for communicating the consent, and then that single consent document that's, in my mind, having run value-based care, like having a singular provider network that we're all aligned through some legal framework to work collaboratively, would a single um, document for consent recognizing what you just said about all the um, nuances that hospitals might bring, but in general, would a single consent with clearly outlining those network of providers who agreed to collaborate, plus a, a mapping of the, where the data may be shared, would that be sufficient? Does that exist in other communities? It doesn't exist a lot, but that's the A answer. The mapping will show you who needs to be listed on the consent. Remember when I had the diagram of like all the little post-it notes? So even like if you're the stakeholder that wants some data feedback, um, that person, sometimes they want personal information. So they would be on the consent. Um, your transportation, if you are um, an SUD provider and you're telling people, I need you to pick up someone from recovery housing and drive them to my treatment facility, right, or things like that, Think very broadly about who might end up receiving information from someone that's required to keep it protected and put them on the list and allow these ongoing dynamic conversations within and between the people on the list. Now, some are one off conversations and those should be on separate consent documents. But the ones that are part of the dynamic team, if you do a good job mapping and you have it well outlined on your document and you show what information you're sharing and why and the dynamic ongoing nature of the relationship, and the dynamic ongoing nature of the relationship is something that's not part of the sample forms. It really never is. But if you build that in, that can provide the protection. And then again, if an entity wants extra forms, that's fine. But at least you have one that covers the nature of the collaboration. Erickson, do you want to close this out? Yeah, I was going to say thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I, I noticed that we are at time. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and the information you shared today. It was very helpful in a lot of the conversations we've had over the last few months. Um, thank you all for as well for joining this call today. Um, truly appreciate the turnout that we had today and um, call for this call for this call. So you have a wonderful rest of your day and your weekend. Um, we'll see you next time in September on September 12th, I believe, at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Glad everybody. to join in.